Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here, both from Brighton and uh, from previous uh, lives. Uh, also, people from the British uh, Computer Society, and uh, so it's it's really kind of like a family ga ga gathering. Really, I can actually say uh, here. I, when I actually started to think about this inaugural uh, lecture, which, by the way, I should have given about a year ago, really, if I wasn't that <laughs> too busy, really. Uh, I was actually thinking, where do you actually start? And I try, you know, you always kind of try to think back to the beginning of your career. Where do we start, really? And uh, so that's what I'm actually going to talk about. And where do we actually start? Well, this person, I know it doesn't look very much like me, but that's how I was when I came, uh, first came from Greece. <laughs> and uh, quite different. This is really me working at the uh, joint. Uh, um, uh, uh, Taurus, really, the fusion reactor in uh, Oxfordshire, kind of thing. So that, that's where we actually w started. And looking back, really, I have to actually say that the one thing that's always with me is that I'm an engineer solving problems. I may have moved away from solving the problems in a more traditional engineering uh, kind of uh, way to more the software, because the lure of computing and the possibilities of what you can do with computing, really, especially in the last uh, years, has, is so exciting, really, to actually drive people away even from, uh, uh, from the, the beauty of actually being an, enge uh, an, an engineer. But really, it, I always have tried to apply things into engineering, manufacturing, increasingly to business, finance, and ma uh, marketing, because I keep saying, uh, with engineering, you change the world. But that's where the most of the money was for the funding, <laughs> as life. Uh, also, e science, e learning, and sport. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. But that's kind of a possibly the boring, because people told me inaugural lecture is about your opportunity to talk about life, the universe, and everything. So that's, that's kind of not really there. So where do we actually start? Well, we start, I actually thought, let's, let's rethink, really, rewind. OK, that's Greek to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A lot of Greek people around me actually kind of realize that what this thing says is in the beginning was the word. Yeah. Well, so it's John 1. Now, people may not know me as the most religious person, really, but I think it's always a good point to actually go back to the beginning, really. Uh, and really, it's all about in the beginning, there was a word. <laughs> is an interesting mistranslation of the original Greek. In the beginning, what it actually said is logos. Logos is reasoning. Okay, And the whole role of people, we as people, are actually here to try to uncover, use the reasoning, use the reasoning that we actually have, to understand the world and change the world by our human reasoning. And that's what, we've, uh, we've, uh, that, uh, that's what humankind, and specifically engineers, actually try to actually do from the beginning. You're trying to understand, and you're trying to actually find how nature actually works, and you use that to change the world, solve problems, move things forward. Now, within that, there has been a number of disruptive uh, innovations that expanded the human uh, uh, reasoning. The invention of books allowed us to do, do much more reasoning than we could actually do before. The travel and communications actually allowed us to actually be able to talk to each other and actually reason and actually solve problems at a larger scale. But really, the big, latest uh, disruptive technology is actually this of computers. Computing has actually broken down both the barrier of the volume of what you can actually kind of deal with, of knowledge, really, and the barriers of distance. Okay, and they allow us to actually do things, but also they are actually sometimes taking over and changing our lives to in, in a very profound uh, uh, way, especially the last uh, years. Now, we as humans and as near, we're trying to unlock the reasoning by actually understanding the world, modeling the world ar ar around us. I mean, it's very interesting, uh, you know, in, in my early career as a CFT modeler, trying to understand and try to apply this holy e equations of Navier Stokes equations were there and solve them to actually pr solve uh, something uh, uh, and move things forward. And then 
moving forward to actually find out that you could actually, but computer reasoning, you could actually do even much more. You can really do quite a lot of solving of problems. Now, there is a question here really to actually kind of uh, think, can the computers reason? There's a lot of discussion in my area of AI really, and a lot of it is this guy's fault. <laughs> uh, Alan Turing, 100 years would have been today really, uh, uh, this year. Uh, the guy who actually is the father of both artificial intelligence and computer science, and also, also known behind the, this is the bomb, the first computer, it's actually now in uh, um, a Bessley Park in Milton Keynes really, uh, where you can actually, where the Enigma machine was actually broken really, and actually did change profoundly the, uh, wor the world with computing. To a large extent, do the computers reason like humans was actually something that we, uh, we AI uh, uh, people back in the AI, uh, uh, in the 80s, f uh, fought. And people still really fight. I remember every, t every year we have our AI conference up, up, up in Cambridge, and there's a lot of discussion about how do I know that whether this is a computer or it's actually artificial intelligence? And does this artificial intelligence think like a person? And there's, of, co of course, a very well known Turing test that actually says that how do I know that a computer has actually achieved artificial intelligence, real artificial intelligence? Well, if I can put a computer and a person on the room next door with a little hatch and I keep passing information on little pieces of uh, uh, paper from one to the other, if after in enough iterations I cannot tell whether on the other side is a human or a person, then that's artificial intelligence. Right. Having said that, this is something that's keeping, to a large extent, has actually kept AI f back in, in a number of, of ways, in, in my view, from actually what it actually does. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, putting intelligence within, embedding intelligence within systems, is about not taking over the world. You know, don't worry, the robots are not going to take the world and get rid of us, really, kind of thing. But the computers are extending the human reasoning. And in the same way that if I was actually building airplanes, and the first time that people actually started designing airplanes, they didn't actually, they weren't worried about should I actually kind of design something that looks like a bird or not. However, we were definitely inspired by birds, and of course, you could actually overdo it, and that doesn't work really. That's a very famous <laughs> Birdman competition, really, kind of thing. But at the end of the day, what you do, you're inspired from the, by nature, but you build technology that's actually fit for pr purpose. And I, wouldn't, I would actually try to think, would anybody think that how can I tell whether I'm on a bird or in an airplane? That wouldn't be something that, an engi and, uh, that would not concern the engineers. I actually t tell some of my colleagues, really, why should we worry too much about whether computers are thinking or not? The computers are there, they're helping us run our lives, and they're extending our ways of actually dealing, uh, solving problems, and doing uh, uh, things in everyday life. So this is really what I would call the AI in the er era of Google. Now, it's really very interesting. You will never hear Google saying, we are an AI uh, company. However, they are by far the largest AI company, machine learning company there is out there. Why? Because there is this thing about using artificial intelligence is untrusted technology that you can't really rely on and whatever. But Google is actually working. And when I go there, it finds things that there's no way that I would actually think, well, perhaps there are some lots of people, every time I put a Google uh, search, there are a lot of people running manically around trying to actually find the solution. No, they're not. It's definitely computer software that does it. There's no other way. So we're kind of moving ahead. And what is important there is that solving real problems using uh, computer power pushes the boundaries of traditional computer science further from where, uh, where we, we are. We can actually do things now that we couldn't actually do uh, years ago. In fact, there are a lot of things that we have actually invented 10 or 20 years ago, but they only became possible now with the advent of, uh, uh, of the internet. 
Uh, problems continue to become complex, uncertain, and ill-defined. And that is really the important, that's the important difference between computers or the first generation, I would say, of computers where everything is actually given, that is a piece of data, to the way that humans work. Humans reason and much more comfortably with uh, and cope with uncertainty. The fact that that's probably the same as this, or that's probably a chair, but it could be something else. We can actually deal with it. Computers are not necessarily, th they don't want, they're digital, digital one or zeros. So to a large extent, we have to actually add a lot to this first generation of computing to actually be able to deal with, if we, uh, to, to deal with uncertainty, with deal with the complexity of our life, if we want to actually move things forward. Uh, the initial approaches of computing have actually been uh, inspired mainly by the uh, cognitive science and nature. So a lot of the original expert systems, as a lot of uh, people would actually know in the 80s, was all about we're trying to actually come up with the rules behind the world. The problem is this. Humans do not think in terms of rules. I mean, if you, so if you solve a problem and you actually ask, what do you do that way? Well, it seemed like a good idea. That's not a rule. Okay, or a hunch is not. Uh, uh, people, and well, that's something we actually find it extremely, uh, for, for the beginning really, working with, uh, uh, with a lot of my co colleagues. I actually came really near the end really of the exit uh, systems era. I mean, I've got here my colleagues, uh, Brian Knight and Don Cowell, who actually kind of were actually down there in the thick of it in the, in, in the early 80s really, where we had to actually kind of deal with experts and say, how can you actually get extract rules out of the experts. And the poor problem is that the experts did not express their knowledge or the problem solving in terms of rules. If that, then that. And again, you go to the point that you can actually get a lot of ideas from nature from all the way nature and the human brain does things, but you're not going to totally copy it and, and repl replicate it. So we have neural networks that are actually there to help us reason, and I suppose it's the closest thing we actually have mathematically to creating a hunch, really, after observing things. And you're saying that's probably that more likely than something else. Genetic algorithms are actually looking at uh, t taking a lot of uh, uh, a leaf out of, uh, uh, out of evolution and uh, biology. And swarm optimization, trying to actually work out how do birds together manage to actually kind of create patterns really, which each one of them cannot actually do very much. And there's a lot of that work that's actually done. The thing is that because increasingly we had more and more data available. I remember you know, back in the 80s or early 90s, you had students who were actually saying, I want to do something in data mining. We had some really puny little data sets to actually give them because there are, weren't any. And even if they were, they were very, very difficult to actually use. They had to anonymize it, et cetera. The, one of the things we actually have now is that we have more data that we can actually cope with. And what now is called big data? I have to say I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the word big data, but it means something really nowadays, really. Because big is not about big only. It's about a number of things. It's about volume. That means that next year, the web, on the web, there will be as much knowledge created as it would, uh, as it, uh, it, I think we're actually ca counting it in uh, uh, exabytes, not even petabytes, really. And who's going to make sense out of it? And most of it is unstructured. It's not really even nicely tabulated uh, values, really, in a spreadsheet. There are videos on YouTube, there are interactions between people, but there is a lot of value there that's actually kind of created that somebody needs to do something with it. Or do they? Or are they actually kind of imposing into things like our privacy uh, and uh, a number of other things that we actually uh, hold dear? And I think to a large extent, and really the volume is actually a very important aspect really, uh, it's not about the volume very much, it's about the variety of uh, data. You've got unstructured data, you've got video, you've got music, you've got interactions between people, emails being sent. 
Actually, if you look at the emails, it's the important thing about looking at uh, extracting, most of the important knowledge about uh, uh, emails is in the structure of them. Who sent it to whom? It gives you much more uh, uh, understanding about what happens than actually kind of reading them. So the fact that I may have actually sent an email to somebody and then they replied, including somebody else, and then they replied, they created another thread and whatever, creates a whole bit of knowledge, really, that you can actually kind of extract and do something useful with. Then there is the issue of velocity. Uh, one of the work we're actually doing now, uh, nowadays, it is a KTP that we just started in uh, SEM uh, uh, recently, is actually to do with um, uh, placing uh, ads on, online. And it's actually about just-in-time uh, uh, marketing. I know it's kind of annoying, really. You'd actually think, I'm in my Google account doing my Gmail. How do they know and th that I'm looking for a tablet? Or how do they, lo they know I'm looking for a jacket? Well, there's a lot of information down there that you can actually put together and serve the right advert to the right person and make a lot of money out of it. But then again, there's the issue. Is that ethical? What about the privacy? And you get out all the discussion about cookies, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, there is a lot of, uh, of that. So velocity is about solving, uh, dealing the data as they're coming. Data that have passed are, uh, are, are, not, are no use anymore, really. Uh, I was yesterday at a meeting of, on big data of the Institute of uh, um, uh, uh, the Internet Advertisers Bureau, where they were actually, actually saying that really <laughs> any data we cannot actually use within a day is totally useless to us. I mean, the fact that you were actually looking to buy a tablet last week, it's not really very useful about serving you an advert now, but it is within that time. And also, it's very important for me to know that you haven't really gone and bought one. So I can actually keep pestering you that. Those marketers, what can I say? Uh, and then the issue, and this is the last V, you see, uh, they're all Vs really, is veracity. OK, so if you get some information, how do you know this is correct? And what can you do with it? And really, there's other issues such as quality, ubiquity, provenance, privacy, security, ownership, openness, et cetera, of data, which is quite an important aspect of it. Uh, and I'll actually tell a little bit about it in, in, in a moment. Now, oops, I've given it away. What's 12 times 13? Okay, you can say that. You've got, you've got a, a young. Okay. Okay, I've given it there, really. <laughs> it's 156. Okay. Now, if you naturally try to solve this problem, how would you actually go about doing it? We know our 12 by 12 tables, but not anything further. So what you do, naturally, you find the closest problem you have, so you remember, and you adapt, you, you retrieve that solution that you have, you know that's 144, and then you adapt it to the new problem. And that's the natural way of thinking. And I would actually say this, that it's all about remembering. To a large extent, more human problem solving is done by remembering and reusing remembered knowledge than by innovating. You know, most of the time, we just do the same thing. You write a new letter. What do you do? Take a letter you wrote before and change it. Why write it from scratch? You write a piece of code. If any, any of our students are actually around, I didn't say that. <laughs> OK? Uh, there's no point. Re, you know, reuse is a very, very important part of what we are actually doing, of solving problems. It's a natural thing. And really, that comes really, the, word, the Greek word for memory is mnemi, was where the word mnemonic comes from, really. It's the other part of it. Being able to remember and reuse knowledge is a very, very important part of, that could actually help s computers solve, uh, solve problems. Now, here's some example of a thing. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's the Antikythera uh, mechanism. It has actually been found in a, uh, a shipwreck near Antikythera. There's an island in, in Greece. And, and people actually found this, and they said, what's that? When they analyzed it, they came up with a whole set of cogs that is actually 
it, it's actually felt it's a very early version of an astrolab, and it actually uh, maps the uh, where where the stars are really, which is quite was very very useful to the uh, uh, to, uh, to sailors really. Now this technology was lost for about fifteen hundred years afterwards. It took another 1,500 years to reinvent the type of technology that you would actually do. And there are similar examples. In 1910, when the Americans, American archaeological uh, um, uh, uh, school in Athens tried to actually recreate the Parthenon and they put together, they actually took the old pins, metal pins, that were actually holding the bits of the, uh, of the stylae. Uh, together the columns, and they moved some. They put something uh, uh, else, which was actually the state-of-the-art steel of the time. Within about ten years, they had to be changed, because the ones from the ancient times managed to withstand two thousand years, and the ones from the early uh, time. And th there is a lot of discussion now, really, about the kind of level of that uh, the ancients would actually have of. Uh, uh, me metall metallurgic knowledge, really. So what I'm actually saying here is that what we actually do is that in the history of, uh, not only we remember, but to a large extent we forget more than we actually remember. And really, there is a big challenge really there about remembering. It's not about remembering technology, it's about remembering people, history, uh, culture, and stuff like that. I'm sure uh, Professor uh, David Arnold really is actually kind of the expert here uh, at Brighton really to that. But I think to a large extent really the idea of actually remembering, reusing uh, is kind of quite a, a big uh, problem, especially when we have untested ways of actually storing that information. I mean I remember trying to actually find some pictures for my children really within about the last 10 years and you can't find where they are, where they are, how many copies they are and where you can actually find them. And Nobody knows that still going to be those CDs will actually still be working in about 20 years or 30 years. Big problem. Then you go this. Okay, let's suppose we remember things. Now that's Usain Bolt, first man running uh, under 880, 88. Okay, the 100 meters, and this is where he did it. Okay, now look at this. His laces are undone. Okay? Now, I can actually then formulate the following logical argument. <laughs> if you want to run <laughs> under 880, you have to undo your laces. <laughs> this is 100% correct, or at that time it was, because nobody else had actually run under that. Okay? This is an example of overfitting that we actually know of actually creating false positive and thing. And actually shows you the problem of of a problematic recall and problematic interpretation of data, really. So that is really quite a big problem. And the thing is that it comes now to the fact that you go to your bank and you actually say, I want a loan. And they say, no, sorry, you're actually, uh, the computer says no, <laughs> as it does. How does the computer, and you say, can I explain why that is? No, there's an algorithm we're actually using. It's actually a state-of-the-art algorithm. Well, you are almost powerless, really, against perhaps an overuse of these technologies, really, where they cannot be transparent, they cannot actually explain themselves. And that is really the kind of flip side of, of that. And I can actually see very well, I mean, I can see the other thing. Every Monday morning, I get a, uh, a text from my bank that says that uh, my wife has actually put a uh, an online thing with uh, uh, an order with uh, Sainsbury's. It's every week, the same time, same amount of, uh, and roughly the same buy. However, something there, there's a rule there that's actually trigger, uh, triggering that sends that text. They don't send me texts about other things. I've actually kind of bought all sorts of things on the internet. L let us not go there. But the, <laughs> it's, and this is really the, the issue, really, because it's the issue about quality. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the research, a little bit very quickly about uh, case-based reasoning. Now, case-based reasoning is the process of reusing knowledge, so solving new problems based on the solution of similar past problems. 
Now, what it actually does, a system, at the end of the day, what you actually do is a, a, a case-based reasoning si system, given a new problem, tries to find similar problems, retrieves the solution of the similar problems, and adapts it to solve the problem in hand. And it looks very, very simple. Well, it's simple for people. It's not simple for machines, for computers. How do you actually do that? Well, the cases are actually, that you actually look at it, it could be several features describing a problem plus the solution of the outcome. So, for example, you go to Amazon, you actually say, I want to buy a computer that has those, uh, those or you actually look at the particular computer. And what you get is an example case based on which collaborative filtering. People who looked at this also looked at that, 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 and that. Okay, so the idea there is using previous knowledge to actually solve other problems. The thing is that it can actually be either episodic problems, that things that really happen, or prototypical. So you could have a doctor, for example, that would actually say, if you have those set of, uh, of uh, indications, really, then that actually means that the diagnosis would actually be that. Or alternatively, you could actually have, and this is really what we usually have, is real cases, really, uh, real life cases to actually deal with. So basically what you get is if you have a particular problem, so you have this problem, I'm actually saying, well, I don't know the solution to that. So what I'll do is I'll find the closest problem that I know, I know the solution of that, and I will adapt it to find that solution. And the idea there is the closest, well, I think the, the idea is that if you have a close enough problem, then the solution of that will actually be close enough. Adaptation is always a bit of a problem, so I'm, I'm going to actually kind of gloss over it. But th that's another 10, 20 years of research, really, which will actually keep us going, uh, hopefully. And this is really the issue, the five R's problem. You have a problem, you retrieve similar cases, you try to reuse solutions, and then if there's something new, you can actually learn. And this is what the process of machine learning. You add new knowledge to the previous uh, uh, one. And a key to the, system, to, to the success of the system is to actually identify similarity and representation. So really, how does a computer know? So how do you actually define a uh, system that says, that looks like this? It's closer than something else. And also, how do you represent? It's fine if you have numbers, but why don't you actually have a picture, say, or that video, it looks like that video, or that music looks like the other piece of mu music. And that's one of the things. Now, what we have actually found, really, in our research uh, over the last few years is that mainly looking at temporal, spatial, things to do with time, space, or structures. And that kind of covers an awful lot of real problems, really, out there. And I'll give you some examples. Digital media, as well including images and uh, video, and also dealing with sometimes with things where we don't know. So there could be bits of it that we don't know, but we can still want to actually match. So it's all about representation similarity. Well, let us concentrate on similarity. <laughs> now, I've got those two characters, really, <laughs> down there. They're not the same person. <laughs> OK, I haven't played with Photoshop. I happen to be related to them. <laughs> OK. And as you can see, uh, similarity is rela relative to the problem in hand. OK. And that's what we actually found, is how close things are actually there. It's not always obvious. There's another two people that uh, are actually there. And there is another similarity. There's a degree of similarity. You could actually try to find features that are actually similar. Well, similarity is also relative. <laughs> it could be a scale. Or it may be more or less obvious. So it's all right. I'll just uh, introduce you by the way to my family, really. So <laughs> and sometimes it's easy to calculate it. So if you have a number of computers, for example, you have CPU, screen, RAM, HD price, it's very easy to find out how close things are by just subtracting a new case. So if you say, how is this closer to this, or is it closer to that? Well, you just find the difference bit there, the difference there, the difference there, the difference there, the difference there. And of course, you have to actually normalize it and sum it with using some kind of weighting 
uh, feature to be able to say how close things are. And this is what you would actually get typically in a recommended system. So when you go to Amazon and they actually say, people who looked at this also looked at that, or if you looked at this, that's the closest one you actually get. That's the kind of things they're actually looking. And that's fine when you have numbers, but sometimes you have symbols there. You have how close is red? Is red closer to blue or to purple? And how close is and how different it is? So there are all these kind of issues that the computer needs to actually do. And even more, we found that in a lot of cases, you could actually identify it in when you have a graph representation. That's one of the key things that we have been doing for a number of years. For example, saying, look at this. That exists there, that exists there. That feature, the existence of those two features, uh, and no normalized as part of the whole thing could actually tell you that something there is actually happening or you have to actually look at. So what you need is you have to have also a formal representation that does the following thing. It should capture all the important features. It should be unambiguous. It should be mathematically. The computers are not good with uncertainty. And we say we have, they have to be, but unless you have a formal representation, it's very, very difficult to actually go uh, there. And you should allow computationally efficient calculations of similarity. And a lot of uh, my mathematician uh, friends always actually keep telling me that you can't do that. It's computationally NP. And uh, I actually find that in a lot of cases, the engineer in me says, well, probably you're right, but let's try anyway. <laughs> OK? And uh, you find in a number of, of cases that, for example, theoretically, if you ask a mathematician, you couldn't possibly have had a uh, tom-tom that would actually take, give you the, uh, uh, the fastest way between A and B. And I agree, it's not an optimized route, possibly. But it does exist. And that's because there's a lot of people really who actually engineered it and made something that computationally was very, very difficult, more easy to calculate, really, in uh, time. So these are the key elements of, of, uh, of this. And then finally, we found that in a lot of cases, especially with spatial temporal data, digital media, social networks, and computer code, I'll give you the examples in a second, uh, the graph representation of cases are, is the way forward. And yeah, so I'll actually show you this is an example. Now, this is Smartfire. That's one of the first things we actually did. It's computational fluid dynamic uh, code that allows you to model the way fire spreads within an enclosure. We were working. Now, you have to appreciate, in order to run one of those at the time, we're talking about the early 90s, you had to have a PhD in, uh, computer uh, in computational fluid dynamics. And we had to work with Home Office that actually said, can we give that tool to, to firemen and the, all the fire brigades to actually use it? And we actually said, oh, no, it will crash. You know, anyone who actually runs CFT knows that you have, to, you have all these false factors that you actually have to get first uh, right until they actually kind of work. And this is really the problem. But having said that, and we solved a number of problems by observing what experts were actually doing. And for example, we created an automatic uh, grid generator who actually used reused knowledge. So it actually said, if you are near the fire, the last time we were the area near the fire, the expert put a lot of little grid because things are happening there. So it was actually putting the same thing. In far away down there, you don't really know a lot of things are happening, so you could actually kind of change it. Also, changing various things like relaxation parameters, etc. And we actually did. This code still runs now, really, uh, and it's actually coupled with uh, its sister code of Exodus, which actually simulates the way people evacuate buildings kind of thing. And it has actually been used for various applications, including various famous uh, plane crashes, King Cross uh, fire, and also the um, evacuation and the fire in the Twin uh, Towers, really, on the 9-11. Uh, and a lot of that smart is actually there. And then we go to another engineering problem. It's the casting. We had all these experts who were actually doing metal casting. And they're all, and you ask them, how do you do it? Well, we have a new wheel. We have this big area office full of uh, filing cabinets with examples of what worked or what didn't work in the past. <coughs> so we built this uh, system that when we actually see how people were actually looking at a three-dimensional shape, we actually worked out that the engineers were looking at it at a little component at a the time. They weren't really thinking 3D. It's not easy to think 3D. 
So following the way we devised a graph representation of something like this and reused the knowledge. And we got a system that about 85% of the time was giving you the right answer, the same as an expert. And in the other, at least 10% of the cases, was giving us a good enough answer that the expert would say, oh, yeah, I, I, that, that also will work, which made that you could actually do a lot of that design. Following from that, and we actually thought, oh, how about we apply similar techniques to similarity between code? That is a tool that, um, among others, can actually reuse code, but also it can detect plagiarism on code. The reason is that sometimes, you know, if, if a student actually comp uh, uh, copies, you can actually obfuscate the code and change the name of variables and stuff like that, but you cannot change the structure of the code. So if you can actually reverse engineer a UML diagram out of uh, code, you could actually show that you, you can actually kind of pick up uh, patterns, even if somebody has actually tried. To, th that wasn't really our main reason to do that. It was mainly trying to actually reuse code, really, actually used in a positive way, and also using for cost estimation. And, and all the, it's one of those. I mean, there's a PhD behind that. There, was a, uh, there are two PhDs before behind the, uh, uh, the ca uh, metal casting, and two PhDs, I think, behind the uh, Smart Fire project. And this is the other thing, really. That's, OK, that's me. That we were actually really lucky being in the CERN right at the time they put the last segment of, of uh, the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider, really. And one of the things we were actually doing is using virtual virtualization to actually deal with the data that were actually coming out of the, co out, out, out of the uh, Atlas experiment. Now, you have to appreciate, if you want to talk about uh, big data, you can't get bigger data than, uh, than that. Well, you can, actually. It's GCHQ <laughs> and Google. But that's quite close, really. I think there's, there's a very close competition there, really, there. And physicists want to have access to this information, and they want to do it fast. So that's another project that uh, we actually did with one, one of my. Uh, but the interesting thing there is this. We, I, I, we go to speak to the people in CERN and actually say, how about the confidentiality and the privacy of data? So what's that? <laughs> We're all open. Physicists, are, so what you actually see, every little problem you actually uh, look, you, it's actually totally different. At the same time, w the previous project we actually did with men engineering companies ended up wearing the company because they said, well, hang on, you're putting all our knowledge really in a, something that could be stolen on a flip or on, on, on a uh, or laptop yeah. and stuff like that. And there, is, there, is, there, are, there are issues really there. This is another example, again, totally tangential. You may think, hang on, what did you actually go? Did you go? Well, as part of our leverage, we trust funded, uh, th we try to actually work out similarity between uh, 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 groups, social networks of uh, lenders in uh, Peru, Tanzania, and uh, India. And what you were actually looking is to actually say, what makes some of those, these people had to actually walk about 20 kilometers every Friday to sign for their, uh, to, uh, for, to pay the loan and actually get the next loan because there are no banks in, uh, uh, in the village. And that's the only way that they can actually kind of get a loan to actually educate the children, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea there is how can you actually tell whether one group is a successful one and giving pumping money into that will actually kind of alleviate poverty and actually pull them out, as opposed to one where things will not actually happen in this way. And we did, there was another PhD again, kind of uh, that actually looks at the ma maps, and you can actually see typically various people, these are persons really, who are key in putting together the uh, 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 group. And also, there are other aspects, aspects of whether people work the same. Uh, area, whether the religion, uh, caste in, in uh, India, etc. really. And again, the interesting thing is these are the same algorithms, more or less, that we're using for metal casting and fire safety engineering. Okay? It's about similarity. And this is another example of looking, uh, there's another PhD that just finished this year, Intelligent Monitoring of Business Workflows. How do we know that something goes wrong? You know, I send you an email, you send another email to somebody, and then something go gets stuck, really. You don't know who was, where, what. Again, that's a, a temporal 
network of events and their temporal relationships that you can actually uh, uh, look uh, into. And you can actually do some monitoring. And also, you can actually explain, and that was one of the things we're actually doing, why that is a problem, not just identifying that. And I think visualization is, very, very, is a very important part of it. And finally, this is a brokering system. Think of it such as uh, when you go to Expedia and stuff like that, where you put one case, but then you don't have one source of information. We have many of those. And each one may actually describe the world in a different words. And then what you need to do is you have to have ways that the various agents can actually talk the same language and consolidate their search. Again, that's another PhD. It just finished about two weeks ago. And so we had also various other things, including the gold stroke analysis. And I was really gutted when the PhD student there decided, after all the work, there was some really good preliminary design, uh, that he doesn't want to actually continue that research, really. What makes a, a good golf stroke? And you may think, why that? Well, because you can actually then use the same technology to actually help people who have mobility problems and stuff like that. And that's kind of a good area that you can actually kind of uh, look uh, at for assisted living. At the same time, I have to actually say that I could finish with this, is that one of the things we're doing is research is fine, but it doesn't necessarily get you out of the university very much. And it's really great if you can actually do it. Over the last, I think, seven years, eight years, we did four KTPs, all two years, and many shorter term, where we have an opportunity to work with industry on real problems. You go to somebody's business, and you actually say what they're trying to do. Uh, and you try to actually, and you find out that there's a number of things that you actually get out of it. You have a catalytic effect. People in industry, they have their next project. They have the ne next thing they have to do, the deadline to do it. They haven't got time to sit back and actually think. And we can actually do that. We can actually fit that. We can actually bring, not that we have the solution to everything, but we have that time, we have that way, the quirky way of thinking, of solving things in a bespoke way. And they actually keep telling us, and I think, that's something that actually, is, it's, it's almost a quote from one of the people who actually were, what we would have been doing if we had time to reflect between chasing projects. This is what we, what we managed to actually do. Then we found that every time we worked with a company, it wasn't the same company that we actually started working with. They were different. Some of them for better. In one case, it meant that because we built something for them, they were actually bought by another company and they were, uh, unfortunately, the guy who actually worked really with, who was actually the engineer, managed to actually lose uh, his job really to the, to, the ma to the other guy who was actually the, 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 the clever business guy really kind of thing in that thing. So you, you win some, you lose some. But generally, the one thing you do is you actually change the world really. And you can actually learn a lot of things. After that, for I think the last 10 years, I've never been in front of uh, a class uh, uh, of students and, uh, and not giving them a case study that actually comes directly from something I've actually done in industry. The students love it because at the end of the day, that's what you can actually do. You can bring that freshness really of real problem. You actually say, you know, I remember solving this problem. I got there and I really thought what you thought, but, but this is what happened. All this storytelling you can actually do. And it does build confidence, not only of the company, but also of us. We're always kind of thinking, well, you know, we're all academics, but how good we are, really, in the real world, really. But also builds the confidence of the company. Companies told us, now we work with you, we can actually now bid for projects that we wouldn't have actually touched before because we got that extra confidence. And inform the teaching, really, in a number of ways, including getting uh, ideas, getting some outputs, really, and uh, case studies for uh, teaching. And again, I'll actually go very, a lot of it actually involved going there and really, in any kind of project, it's not really us trying to actually say, here's your algorithms and one size uh, emits everything. It's about looking at the business, understanding the business, forming a partnership with the customer, and actually solving the problem that they want, not the problem that you think is interesting. Because, you know, we, we like problems for the sake of it sometimes in industry, in, in academia. But really, if you want to go out there, you have to solve the problem that makes a difference to somebody's business, really. And putting the customer at the center, forming a team, really. And that's something that we always uh, uh, get. I mean, it's really interesting to keep going back 
and having drinks really with at least with with all those previous uh, projects. Now the thing is, research is a team sport, and uh, to be honest, it's good to actually say, well, look, Milton's your inaugural you know, professorial lecture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, I'm here because there were people behind before me, there were people with me, and there were people after me uh, working with us, and it's a team sport. And looking at that, you will actually see this is this is my colleague Jishin Ma. Uh, he originally from China, he actually said to me once, he says, you're my oldest brother. I said, why? He said, in China, if you have the same supervisor and he's, you start at first, you're the oldest uh, son. It's a kind of very... Okay. So in that case, that's our father. <laughs> and also, uh, you can actually see here, this is in a conference in Greece, really, where you can see all of us, including our students, uh, uh, Irena and Marcus was actually taking the picture at that time, who are all on our laptops. Well, you can actually see Brian actually reading a book, really. <laughs> and you, you can actually tell the difference. Of course, nowadays, we wouldn't actually be bothering with that. We'll all be on the iPads. And that's me last week in Brussels with uh, Stelios Kapitanakis, who's another PhD student who's joining uh, Sam this uh, January, really, who who is actually fiddling with his iPad, really, during a talk by Lord Winston, really, there on the uh, EU funding. And here are some people that you may actually know more. The, this is the first project that I actually got in uh, uh, with uh, 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 Roger Evans, is actually a reader in uh, uh, computing. And this is uh, Maria Diapuli, is our KTP supervisor, is uh, the first KTP I actually got in uh, 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 said. And really, what's next? I've got some ideas really about what next is further research, uncertainty, explanation, personalization. The agents and hybrid intelligence seems is very, very important. What I'm very interested in is that it's fine to have only memory and remembering and resolving problems, but uh, the way humans solve the problems is by looking at the problem from different angles and then having a meta, at the meta level, meta logic, and saying, in this particular case, I will use this way of reasoning. In this case, I will use another uh, uh, of reasoning. And you can actually do that using agents, really. And that's an, an area that can actually really work. There is another uh, uh, opportunities for enterprise and social engagement facilities, uh, uh, activities, and also more opportunities for work with industry partners. In the last two weeks, I've given two talks to big big data summits, really, where I get cards, people, you know, we want people, we've got tons of data, we don't know what we do, we want, and they ask two things from us. Can, I, can we help them? The second thing is, we need data scientists. And I think, really, that is something that we have to very clearly understand. The kind of person who understands both the mathematics, statistics, machine learning, the, uh, the data aspect of it, and how it impacts a business in different uh, 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 ways, that is something that's very, very needed out there. There is a huge uh, need for those uh, people. Most of the best people are being snapped by the people at Google and that, and there's nothing below that. And I think really in particular that SEM, as a school of computing, engineering, mathematics, has an opportunity to actually kind of plug that at least in postgraduate uh, level in a number of different uh, uh, ways. Now, and here's me here, really, in School of Computing, Engineering, Mathematics, where I, this is what it is. It's, 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 it's basically an area where I feel, really, that we can actually excel. We, this, I found that excellence in both research and teaching, really, and opportunities because of the sheer coverage of all these areas and the fact that engineering is, is part of, the, of, 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 uh, of SEB is an opportunity to actually, for me particularly, to actually come back to my roots, really. I've spent a lot of time, although I think still will do the odd little uh, um, uh, work on the, uh, with finance and b business and marketing, really. But I think there's a lot of more work that could be done where big data, intelligent systems, and engineering can actually be brought together. Uh, and this is all about learning and knowledge, prob uh, a lot producing uh, community, which is made out of both academic staff, the students, and the support staff. It is sometimes it's very easy to actually forget the, st the support staff and all uh, that. And I think for those of you who actually saw outside all, the, we, I think it was very important to actually see the, both the quality 
and the range of stuff that we can actually we are actually doing in this school. And I think I wish really that this school was a little bit more proud of itself, really, kind of thing, uh, because we have a lot to actually be proud of. Okay, and there's a lot to actually do. And I think the idea of actually, and we're kind of working very hard on putting more of an ent enterprise orientation because that's the bit that actually makes the difference really. Being able to actually work <coughs> with the outside world and make our students more employable and bringing some value really back to anything we actually do and some context and impact really. Which brings me to the end. <laughs> <laughs>